Hi there, this is Joe Meadows and welcome to Safety Leaders Now, the show where we cut through the noise and identify the strategies and tactics that today's top safety leaders use to keep their teams safe. On today's episode, we've got James McPherson. If you're listening to this, you're probably already aware of James and his work at Rebranding Safety and Project Meledium, which I'm probably pronouncing incorrectly, but anyway, we'll save that for, for a later date. I think in this episode, you know, James and I, we're, we keep things a little higher level than uh, some of our other episodes, but he has some some really interesting perspectives. I think we dove into some things that I really enjoyed. I got a huge kick out of this conversation, and I hope you will as well. So without further ado, here's our latest episode with James McPherson. James, could, can you uh, introduce yourself and, and kind of let us know what your, your current role is and what your company does. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you very much for having me, Joe. Uh, nice to see you again. Um, my name is James McPherson. I have fingers in many pies. Um, so I primarily run a consultancy company called Risk Fluent, um, which is a startup fresh off the boat. Um, we, we launched this year. We kind of soft launched it last year, but we, we launched this year. But for the last three Three-ish years, I've been running a podcast and a YouTube channel called Rebrand and Safety. So most people actually know me from Rebrand and Safety. Um, within all of that, I've been a safety professional, working across various different industries for 10 years-ish. And prior to that, I was many, many things. Uh, it took me a while to work out what I actually wanted to do. Uh, I was a bit of a teenage layabout for a long time. Um so yeah and then i also run a company with a separate company called project meletium with a business partner and project meletium is a kind of mastermind community like a a a professional development community for people working in safety and risk management um so that essentially is just a group of safety professionals we have weekly calls we have monthly philosophy discussions we have monthly book club two monthly book club and we do quarterly events and loads of other stuff as well so that's a membership but my company is a consultancy the podcast and the YouTube channel in a nutshell. Okay, well, that yeah. It sounds like you don't have much going on. Um, um, we, not trying to be a dad and a dog, a dog owner and a husband as well. Trying to play rugby as well again, because um, I've gained a lot of weight since being a dad. <laughs> I mean, pick up a hobby again. So I'm going rugby tonight after this call. Okay, perfect. Well, I'll, uh, I'll try and not beat you up too much here. So you can save that <laughs> for later. Uh, so you, you, you mentioned, so risk fluent now safety consultancy, um, that's, that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. So can you help, help us understand what, what specifically, um, like what, what are you consulting on and, and what value are, are you providing? Yeah. Um, so risk fluent is essentially like a, a statement piece. So we, I kind of call the company an operational risk consultant um, because I see safety as one of the risks that comes from operations. Um, so that's how we look at it. There's a long-term vision in that, but there's no point bogging us down on that. At the moment, we are a health and safety consultancy um, and we essentially do two types of service. We have technical services, or what I, how I call it, technical services. So that's your normal safety stuff, like, you know, how, where we're going to lose our fingers or not lose our fingers, what's going to fall on our head and how do we manage that? Um, then we have the what we call the transformational side of the company, um, which is the more... We've got a good foundation um, and we want some cultural change stuff. Now, I think it's important to note just quickly that those two are not mutually exclusive because sometimes I'll have a customer that has no technical understanding. All machines are going to take all fingers and it's just really, really bad. But I don't go in and go, oh, it's technical first and then it's cultural. Like they're they're one in the same, Um, but we we split the the package, not packages, but we split the services because it's just really hard to describe what what we do for people on a website. So it's kind of like a lot of the time a customer rings up and they're like, I think this is what we want. And we're like, actually, you, like we're going to start here, for example. But ultimately, we do technical services, cultural services is like the two ways to describe it. Okay. So maybe as a as a fellow entrepreneur, um, I, I want to I'm, I'm going to workshop 
this with you a little bit while we're here, just, just oh, for no. my own entertainment. So the no, so maybe not not to describe what it is that you do, but can you help me understand on the technical side and on the cultural side, what is the like what is the value I would get from you as a as a potential client? So if I hired you as on on the technical side, what value could I expect to receive rather than like what it is you're going to do to deliver that value? I always try to use this one liner of like no matter what type of service you do with us whether it's technical or cultural I always try to use this example if we had like another Grenfell type situation in the UK whether it was an explosion a fire a machine lost an arm I would I try to say to all kind of managing directors owners that what we try to do is not give you a false sense of security, which I think a lot of current safety does at the moment. I want to give you a 100% backable sense of confidence that you see something on the news and you wake up and you go, that won't be my site. Instead of going, ooh, that is that that won't be one of mine, surely. Like you turn around and you go, I am 99% sure that won't be one of mine. Um, so that, in a nutshell, that's how I try to describe what we're trying to deliver is a tangible sense of confidence, not a false sense of confidence. Excuse me. And and so for that tangible, like what, what would be the indicators in place that for me as an executive who's gone and hired you, where I would be able to say, oh, because I'm seeing X, Y, and Z, I have that tangible sense of confidence. What What would be in place there that would help me understand that I'm I, again, I'm not, I haven't hired this consultancy who's who's blowing a bunch of hot air, but that I, I do have that real tangible confidence. What what would I see that would give me that value? Uh, ultimately, Joe, like that is the big question in safety because we we have for so long been like, we don't have any accidents and we must be safe. And then all of a sudden, Deepwater Horizon happened and we were all like, oh shit. You mean they were there given a safety award on the day that it exploded and they'd had X amount of years, no incidents. We were all kind of like, how do we measure safety? So for me, what we're trying to talk about, whether again, whether it's cultural or technical, it doesn't matter, but it's one of the most important things I think um, nearly all companies can do is understand where are you getting those signals and stories from your workplace? Right. So we, I think near miss reporting is such a great example because we're so terribly bad at it, in my experience. The, essentially, what a near miss is, is, is like maybe not a weak signal because something's happened. It's probably more like a medium signal, right? So in like resilience engineering, they talk about like weak signals, things that are like a little indicator that something could be an opportunity or, or a risk, right? Near miss is probably like a medium signal because something nearly happened, hence you spotted it. Right. So we do loads of this near miss reporting, loads of paperwork. And so many times I'm like, so I was on a site the other day. Here's a good, here's a good example. Actually, I was on a site the other day and I, they'd had a meeting every day. And they're like, how many near misses have we had? And they have, and they write on the board four near misses. Right. I could walk through that site and be like, oh, I've, I've seen 6,000 near misses already because we just, we, we defined it slightly. So we, slightly wrong in my opinion so maybe it's where we should go actually i've seen a little bit of a weak signal here not a near miss like near miss is also a bit late so things like that like getting out on the shop floor and talking and looking and then reacting so i'd like to see companies that i work with eventually when they're ready measuring how we learn from the workplace so how we picking these things up and how we react into it. So this is, it's not this like state we're trying to achieve. It's this constant state that we are. So really, how do you measure it? Is that you feel like you're confident. And not only do you feel like you, you're confident, when somebody, you or somebody else, really starts to question it, then you can come back with some answers. I can sit with anyone that's got risk assessments, and I can normally really highlight some gaps in reality versus paperwork quite quickly. And I think most good safety professionals can as well. And we, we spoke about risk assessments a lot when you're on my podcast, but, and, and it's a fundamental flow in a process, but we can do the same with anything, lift plans, 
incident reporting, you know, there's this work has done work as imagined. So for me, it's, it's, you, you get a sense of confidence, but it's backable. Like, so you can, you can explain it. So it's not like, oh, I've got risk assessments. It's like, I've got risk assessments and I know that if I go on the shop floor, I can have a conversation with the workforce as to how we're managing risk and how they're managing risk and their, their level of competency. I, I actually listen to it. I'm, I'm kind of, kind of uh, spitballing this, actually. It's developing more in my head the more I talk about it. But I was listening to a, a podcast the other day and this lady was talking from a retail perspective about Slack. So Slack in operations, right? And she said, you need to decide what type of company you are. And she was saying that, you're either a a supermarket that wants all the products, like all the different versions of of one type of product, so like fifty different types of tomato sauce, yeah. But there's a trade off to that. That means that when a customer talks to that uh, employee, they won't have good knowledge of that product because there's too many of them. They can't know, right? Or do you want to be the type of cu- the type of business where the customer goes, "Hey, um." Hi Joe, I just um you work here, right? Yeah, yeah, I work here. I just um wondered what tomato sauces you've got. And they go, ah, oh, we've got two types of smart sauce. What are you making? Oh, I'm making a I don't know, fish and chips, <laughs> right? Because because British. And yeah, um yeah. and then <laughs> on, on brand, like, nice work. <laughs> so oh for fish and chips, this tomato sauce is definitely <laughs> the best one because there's only two or three products, so they've got loads of yeah. slack to be able to focus on it. So for me, if we if we flip that and put it into safety, it's it's that, it's the slack in the operations that if I talk to the shop floor and I say, how are we managing the safety or the risk of this process? They can turn around and say, ah, that's because we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing this, we're doing that. Not that they turn around and go, because we've got a risk assessment and a standard operating procedure. Like, it's it's them being able to turn around because they've got the slack to do so and have that conversation, that valuable conversation. That's ultimately where we need to get to. Do every does every customer get that? Depends on you know what they want, where they are in their mature maturity journey. But ultimately the end goal for me, a CEO, an MD, an FD can go on the shop floor and have a valuable conversation about how we're managing the risk in that moment. So, so do you think that's that's kind of a, a situation of, I, I know one of the other uh, episodes we recorded, I was speaking to Bill Cobb and, and Bill was talking about kind of doing less better. Is that is that kind of what you're referring to as Slack? Like that, that it's about reducing uh, quantity and increasing quality and, and focusing on the things that, that we need to do uh, that, that, that really are driving value and, and cutting out a little bit of the fluff? Definitely cutting out of fluff. I think there's a lot of decluttering that needs to go on in organizations. Like, like, are we delivering value? So I, I always use this example when I've done a couple of keynotes or when I'm talking to people of when I was trying to get people to do a forklift pre-use check, right? It was a freaking not, sorry. I don't know if we swear. My what? apologies if we swear. Go for it. Because I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, we haven't yeah. really established that rule yet, but I'm I'm I, I'm a sailor. It. I feel like this is on brand for me. Swear <laughs> away. So it was absolute fucking nightmare to try and get these lads to do this forklift track, right? So they it was it was classic safety. It was like tick 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 tick, and then you get on and be like, the seatbelt's not working. Why have you ticked off the seatbelt? Like so, it was just this constant battle all the time and and ultimately we came to the point where we, we tried everything different types of checks and app and loads of stuff we got rid of the checkbook we got rid of the checkbook and we we spent a lot of time on increasing their competency so we we kind of took a bit of a a high performing teams approach we increase their competency we drilled it a lot more we we're having more conversations around around the the critical safety points of a truck and stuff like that but then when i say that people freak out right they go oh, but how do we prove it where's the record keeping going and, and and we do have to do that right we've all got insurers the hsc turn up tomorrow and there's the easy way to check is like jump on the truck and check it yourself like go and have a look I, I like that's that confidence thing for me. Like I want a CEO or my customers to turn around and go, you know, someone goes to them, how do I know you're checking the trucks? Go out and look at my trucks. Go out and look, trust me, go out and look, um, talk to my guys and girls on the shop floor. 
but okay, we need a record. So what we did was we had this handover process with our in-house maintenance team, and that was recorded. Um, so they had a diary, they recorded everything they do, and they, they did that anyway for, for our planned preventative maintenance program so that we could track all of our maintenance. So they were doing that. So there was no need for the, the shop floor people to record the check. So we kind of de decluttered it because it was bringing no value other than the fact that we were just counting loads and loads of paperwork, but it was impacting the value of the check. So we got rid of that. Mm. We decluttered that. And I think that's a great example. I didn't even know what decluttering meant. And when we did this, we were just winging it and it seemed to work. Um, so that's a really good example. I think there's loads of that. There's loads of paperwork. There's loads of systems that really deliver no value whatsoever, um, but take up a hell of a lot of time. But ultimately as well, I think there's an interesting point in, in that phrase, doing less better, which I really like. And I think for safety, that makes a lot of sense, makes a lot of sense. Does it make a lot of sense for a whole company? Probably not. Like if you went to Amazon, I'd like you to do less better. They'd be like, uh, our model is do more quicker. Like that, that's our literal sales model. And if I got a contract at Amazon, I think I would shit myself because right these guys, their model is get it to the door yesterday. So there's those trade-offs and conflicts. So I think we need to, we need to go, is safety do less better? Probably. I think that's a really good um, way to look at safety, but there is a trade-off to that in that doing less better means we're doing less. And from a commercial point of view, that might clash with the purpose. So I think another thing uh, that I would have, another conversation I would have with either someone we are mentoring or a customer is where does safety sit within the purpose of the organization? So how do I contribute to that? I, I, I have, have I interviewed him yet? Well, especially maybe him yesterday, actually, and my internet's been crap, so we canceled it. But I, I'm going to interview the head of safety for Mercedes Formula One in the UK. And there's one thing he's going to say, because I know I told him, you need to tell, you need to make sure you say that again on the recorded podcast. He's going to say, on his interview, he was asked, how are you going to bring your 10 seconds to the car? He said, what do you mean? He said, well, everyone at, everyone at Mercedes Formula One has a job in their, it has a job to do in their department. And everyone can tell me what, how that job brings 10 seconds to the car. So he said, how is safety going to bring 10 seconds to the car? He had no planning for that question whatsoever. And I was like, what a beautiful question that is. How many times do we ask safety, how do you contribute to the business? So if you're safety for Amazon, how do you contribute to faster, quicker, like more products, whatever their model is? Really hard, but ultimately you've got to do that because that's to justify your existence within the organization. Yeah, I, I, I'm loving that, you, that you're bringing this up because I feel like that has been the most recurring sentiment that, that's been picked up on, on the interviews that we've done so far, you know, trying to to dissect kind of safety leaders in, in large organizations and understanding what makes them successful. And it's that kind of instinct for, for the folks who aren't, you know, again, sort of standing on a soapbox screaming safety needs more respect who th these are people who, who have been able to execute within those organizations, get to those roles where ultimately they're having that huge impact. And the one thing that they all say is like, we're here to make money. And, and it's not about using that as a justification to be lax. It's about saying, yeah. I need to think about this as an executive in the organization and say like, what we can't detach ourselves from that, us from that reality. And I think maybe the, the alternative kind of um, uh, parable here or, or anecdote, it, instead of saying doing less better, it's the uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast, uh, which, yeah. which I think is, is more uh, palatable maybe to, to, to executives. It's, it's like, do you know what, like the, my, the thing that people get really annoyed that I say all the time is blanket rules don't work, right? Blanket rules, blanket statements, blanket philosophies, blank, blanket anything doesn't work. A blanket is only good for one thing when it's bloody cold and you want, you want to warm up on the sofa. That's it. So having a blanket approach to everything doesn't work because even in safety, there are some times where safety is not going to be a priority. Like if my director of finance in my company, for example, sat in a office all day long, but they're dealing with like million pounds, hopefully one day they're dealing with million pound deals, right? I don't want them thinking about safety. 
at all. Yeah. I wasn't thinking about those million pound deals. Don't screw that up, please. Like, it's really important to me. But if I've got a consultant on the road who's on site and I don't know, maybe they're up the scaffold in the middle of the building doing some work with, with the shop floor kind of stuff, you know, I want them to be thinking about their safety 100% because they're up the top of the scaffold. So for, for a business that's doing, say, like manufacturing, it's like within your company, so that, that kind of doing less better is very similar to um, what Eric Honagel, who's, I know we don't want to get academic and I'm not going to get academic, but he's an academic guy and he talks about the thoroughness and efficiency trade-off, which I really like, right? So basically you're either thorough or you're thorough. I always struggle to say that. You're either thorough or you're quick, right? So it's one or the other. You're, you're slow and focused or you're quick and not focused, right? So which one is it? Sometimes in our operations, we need to slow down and we need to focus on safety. Sometimes it's cool for us to just go mega quick, man. So when, when we're in safety, we're trying to design in a process to enable our workers to focus on other stuff. And then sometimes there's parts in a process where they can't focus on other stuff because it's that high risk, because there's a lot of residual risk or, or something like that. So these things like these platitudes, like safety first or safety is not number one agenda item. It's like, it doesn't fucking matter if it's at the top of your agenda or not. Cause if you have got a meeting about how we get this order out the door, otherwise this customer leaves and then the business goes bust, please don't talk about safety. Talk about getting this product out the door, obviously safely, but you know, within a, within a mind, within, within a framework there it's everything has a time and a place. I'll get off my soapbox now, but you know, that, yeah. that stuff really does gets me twitching. But, but, but I think part of that, right. Is it, part of it is about proportionality. And I think that's actually one of the, you know, you're talking about decluttering and doing less. I think that's, that's where safety professionals have hurt the profession is maybe without that sense of proportionality, you know, you layer process and process and process and all the people who, you know, that translates into 30 or 45 minutes of their work day every day. And they, it's, obvious to them that this isn't truly about managing risk this is just about you know some idea somebody cooked up that that's going to reduce people's sensitivity to really care when it does matter and so i think you know for for you know i think we spoke about this before but one of my biggest um, kind of things is that the, the fundamental role of a safety professional is about decision guidance and so if you're going to guide a decision it's it um you need to know what that decision is. You can't, it, it can't be blanket. It can't apply in every scenario because it's, it has to be proportional to the decision being made. So you can guide it in a way that's rational. So I think. I actually, that, you, I, that, that phraseology that, that you gave me, that phraseology, that risk guidance, decision guide. I actually use that now, like all yeah. the time. I told people, well, let's not, let's not call a risk assessment a risk assessment. Let's call it guidance. And then was like, <gasps> at first I was like, Oh my God, what? Now it's a risk assessment. Nah. It was when you did it, and now it's there. It's more like guidance. Um, and at first, I don't get it. But when you start to explain it, I was actually in a meeting yesterday, and this company had, like, they, they, they were lifting. They basically make massive bits of machinery, right? So they have loads of crane work, in, in, internal crane work, loads of crane work. And they're lifting, like, 1,000-ton bits of kit and moving them up, down, left, right, but all over the place. And they got loads of lift plans, like loads of written lift plans, right? And I wrote my name in the dust on all of them. And we were doing like these, these kind of cultural, <laughs> we were doing these cultural, we we were being employed in there to do like a cultural kind of behavioral uh, improvement plan and stuff like that. So we spent loads of time just watching, talking to people on the shop floor. And I went around and wrote my name on the first day, wrote my name on the dust of all these lift plans, right? And then I came back two days later, my name was still there, like perfectly written in there. So I was like, okay, now I 100% know no one's touching these. Like it could have just been a really dusty process, but yeah. 100% I know when I know one touching it. So I was like, okay, cool. I left it like it. And uh, anyway, long story short. So I posed that we'd done a report and we'd, we'd fed it back to him. And I had, a, we had a meeting about, the report to have a discussion with the senior leadership team and the the head of ops and the, the the senior supervisor or whatever of ops was in the room and and he was like 
one of them was like, so what, I mean, what do you want from that game? So do you, you want our guys to go over and read the lift plans every single time we're going to do a lift? Like these guys, they know how to lift. And I'm like, yes, they do. Yes, they do. So do you think they should read those lift plans? He was like, nah, we'd be there all day. I said, yes, exactly that. That's exactly my point. So what is that lift plan then? And he was kind of like, oh, I don't know, clutter? I said, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Maybe there is a little bit of clutter to it. But ultimately, it's like a form of guidance. So we might use that to train people, induct people, use it for the first time. Maybe you've done it for a long time. You think, actually, I can't remember how to do this. But it's really static. It's not dealing with that dynamic nature of work every day. But we also had no process or no training or no competency or no principles, which was where we got to in the end, in the workforce. So people actually doing the lift, they weren't thinking about the lift at all, right? Mm. So we were. I asked every single person I spoke to when we were doing the assessment the same question. I asked them loads of questions, but one question I asked them, what's safety like here? And they all turned around, every single one of them turned around and said, really safe. I was like, okay, cool. Why is it, why is it really safe? Because it's really tidy. Every, the housekeeping, everyone spoke, and it was a really tidy site. Everyone spoke about housekeeping. Even though these guys are lifting pieces of the kit, that if you dropped, it would squish you like an ant underneath your boot, right? Not one of them said, yeah, because I always think about my chains or the, the crane controls. Or Not one of them spoke about how, the, how we lift. So I said, and that is a lift plan. Those guys go in, okay, I'm about to lift this. Where am I going? How does it move? So that's like what many people would call a dynamic risk assessment. Replace lift plan for risk assessment. The same applies. They weren't talking about it. So these kind of lift plans became risk or decision or process guidance, whatever we want to call them. Um, and we advised to them that we need to give people principles of lifting. Um of how to go through that process and be mindful of the risks they're about to do. So many companies I have that conversation with, so many. Whether it's lift or risk, same thing. I, I think that's super insightful because the, um, you know, we, that, that identification to that company of saying, you're calling this a lift plan as if it is, you know, somebody could come in externally and assume you create this plan for every single lift you do when the reality is it's, you know, some dusty laminated piece of paper. Yeah. And I think you identifying that, Hey, in this case, what, what this actually is, is, you know, in situations where the decision is not clear. So you've either not done it before, or, you know, s some scenario has changed that, that it's a reference point. I think, you know, that, that's a great example of one of the things that I'm the most passionate about, which is that I just think there is, I, I think the safety profession uh, or the workplace risk profession is so like, I, I don't know if there is a professional group more rife with cognitive dissonance around <laughs> simply yeah. just not being, not being on intellectually <laughs> honest about what these things are. Yeah. And, and so if we said, Hey, this is what, this is actually what this document is. We're not just going to go by the sort of the terms that everybody uses, but we're going to say, oh, what this is doing is we, what we actually want this to do is take a new person and make sure that they're familiar with the process before they do it. Well, if yeah. you were honest about what that was, you could actually set up a process to measure that and ensure that that was happening when it mattered. Yeah. And you would allow people to not care in those other cases. But if what you're saying is, oh, this is a lift plan and that's how we tick that box, then and, and then people wonder, you know, again, I, I feel like so much of, let's say, safety media is is people on a soapbox talking about safety, not getting any respect. And it's like, well, you're not acting in a way that that me as an ex like an operational executive, I'd be like, this is the most fluffy BS I've ever seen. Like, why would I waste my time with you here? Yeah, um, yeah. So, so I want to I want to circle back, actually. You yeah, know, this is a good jumping off point. Let's 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 give this segue a try. Um, mm -hmm. er, earlier, you were talking about you know, one of the things you're looking for uh, when you come in as a consultant is kind of signals and stories. Um, yeah. And in that, you know, you gave the example of, um, you know, coming into a company that had, uh, you know, six near misses that they were happy with, and you could see 6,000. Or, you know, you gave the example of people who are doing a forklift check that that wasn't doing anything until you could scrap it. And so what I'm curious about here is, to me, those are all signals, right? It's It's, a near miss is a signal, a forklift chef is, is allegedly a signal, but yeah. I think there's an opportunity to talk about signal quality. And nobody, 
if we're mm -hmm. just simp if we're treating near miss as a binary value, but we have no agreed upon definition of universally, what does this mean? You know, I, I guess for me as somebody more on on the tech side of things, this is to me the fundamental failing of health and safety professionals, or or let's say the health and safety um, intellectual space is yeah. that we have a lot of arguments around the value of certain things, but the definitions of what those things are differ from person to person. So, yeah. so it kind of, the whole argument is moot. Uh, so, so do you think there's an opportunity to, how do we, how do we define the value or the quality of what it, like what a near miss is telling us? Uh, mm. how, how do we understand that? across organizations because i think for you in a consultancy perspective you you're able to establish a common definition you know across the companies that you work with yeah. but then if you go to you know a, a third party company and they say we have 4 million near misses mm. then you you might have concerns in the other direction to say like your definition might be a bit broad <laughs> uh and, and and in that case again the, the conversation falls apart so yeah. do you think where do you see the opportunities for us to establish a little bit more commonality here? Like where, where, where's that baseline database? Who, who should be responsible for putting that together? Okay, there's a lot there to unpack. Um, so when there is, so uh, my approach when there is no universal definition is like uh, within our company, we need to have our definition. So like, and I think near miss is a really good example of that. The um, like, so if if, if many if anyone's talking to me about near misses, I say, okay, cool. What? How do you define a near miss? And I, I've had this conversation so many times. How do you define a near miss? Um, so I remember having this exam, this conversation with um, a guy that run a team of on the road engineers, and he was like, James, my biggest risk is driving at work. And I'm like, okay, cool. And he's like, and there's one thing I want to get, I want to improve on, James, near miss reporting. I said, okay, cool. That's fine. You know, not a fan of the title, but we'll go with that. Um, what is a near miss? And he was like, well, I, I always forget the exact example, but what he described was 100% incidents. Like, so he was like, oh, if I bump my car on like a parking bollard, um, but, you know, no one's really hurt themselves. I was like, but you've, you've damaged the car. That's an incident. Yeah. You know, and it was examples like that. And he was like, oh, yeah. Um, I was like, so you're moaning at your guys because you're not, they're not reporting near misses, but you, you don't even know what a near misses yourself. So I was like, so you've driven on the motorway quite a lot of times. You said, yeah. I said, now how many times there's some, we call them dickheads in the UK. How many times does some dickhead drive past you at 100, 120 miles an hour? Mm -hmm. Right. And <laughs> It just remind me of a TikTok I saw the other day that was like, if you get someone like that, there's an American that goes, I know you're Canadian. And I, I, I know I'm not, I'm not putting you in the same box, but they, and the TikTok. Not offended. Not offended. Right. And, um, and it was like American and it goes fast. Like, oh my God, he was going so fast. <laughs> the British person, the car goes zoom. And the guy just goes, dickhead. That is literally what we do. That was so true. Anyway, sorry. I just thought it was so funny. Um, so yeah, I was like, is that an near miss? And he was like, oh, James, if we said that was a near miss, we'd be reporting that all the time. I said, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Do we want that? Well, no, we don't want that. Why don't we want it? Because nothing we can do with it. Okay, we're going, we're getting somewhere now. So to come back to your next point is how do we define the value of these things is what is what you do with it, in my opinion. Like, it's not valuable if you don't do anything. You'd have a really beautiful brand new hammer right? But if you don't need to hit any nails in the wall, there's no point fucking having it. So like, it's not valuable to you at all. So for me, it, where's the value is what you do with it. That That's how I look at it. Yeah. And when I think this, that's such a, I, I'm glad you gave that example because, you know, for, for me, kind of in my professional capacity, we talk a lot about near miss reporting. And what we often talk about is the, or some companies we work with, they define a near miss as like what we would just call kind of like a safety workplace observation. Like you see an opportunity where maybe something could go awry. And I can see a world where you'd kind of say, this is a, a near miss, but I know in, in our definition, that's, we want to have that signal be separate for, from near misses so that we can have a wider funnel of the signals that we receive. And for us, you know, if, if you're going to state 
that you have a near miss, it runs you through the exact same flow in our software as if you had an incident, because the way we define it is like you got up to the edge and you, and you didn't go there. So mm -hmm. we should treat this as if it's an incident so that we can, we can benefit from, from the, the fact that, okay, there were no consequences in this case, but all the kind of factors were present. You know, the, the spanner falls off the ducting and lands beside you. Well, you just as easily could have been standing under that tool and it could have smacked you in the head. So let's treat it as if you did. And yeah. I'm not, I'm not even going to sit here and say that's the perfect definition, but I think it's the fact that those are, that, that there is that kind of, um, that space that it's such that a, underlines a lot of our conversations. Well, I think it's, I mean, it's interesting because I was working with a different customer, um, these last few weeks, um, who are, who are in a really, really bad place. And, um, the first day I was with them. Um, I was in the office, you know, getting to know the, the main person that was going to be our main contract uh, contact. Um, and he's like, oh, JJ, you come to our morning operations meeting. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that'd be a really good insight. Um, first red flag for me, safety is always at the top of our agenda. Um, and uh, I'm like, okay, cool, right. If you back that up, I, I don't really care. Like, okay, I'm happy with that if it's backed up. But like, I just... I've already made my point on being at the first agenda anyway. So anyway, long story short. Um, and he's like, any near misses? And all of them were like, yeah, we've had uh, four, no four near misses today, three near misses, two near misses. And they're all like, yeah, Bob like tripped over or or this little thing happened, right? And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. I'm not going to say whether it's good or bad right now because I don't know the context. I, I, I don't know enough context to justify whether that was valuable or not. The conversation seemed okay it was like reasonably valuable they were talking about fixing a problem i was like okay i like that All right mate i get to freaking site and i'm like you're talking about people tripping on this stone out here i'm like that machine would not pass any any type of inspection like if the hsc turned up tomorrow they're shutting that down like i go to another machine three e-stops broken no e-stop on this long conveyor belt um the structural integrity of this raised building that they were in i'm like it's been hit by an excavator about six million times uh the roof was caving in i'm like man we're over here talking about near misses Motherfucker, you can't even deal with everyday normal work. Like, I don't care about your new misses right now. Um, and, and I just think, like, where's the value right now talking about near misses? Like, that, like we were talking about near misses of, like, things that were nearly an incident. When you've got things that are 100% really wrong, like, really wrong. You're going to lose fingers. You're going to – but because no one's touching it – or nearly touched it and gone, oh, that's a near miss. Let's talk about that. We weren't, we weren't doing anything about it. And we had check after they do defect checks every morning and just every day, e-stock's not working, e-stock's not working, e-stock's not working. I'm like, stop wasting your time talking about near misses. Let's fix these freaking machines, please. Like, and so sometimes near misses is good and it's good conversations and, and it is what you do with it. And sometimes it's like, why are we talking about near misses? Well, uh, I, so I wasn't expecting this to become a near miss conversation, but you just hit on one of my very favorite topics, which is that I think what you've just explained is emblematic of like, frankly, what I see is the lack of sophistication in the conversations around safety. And I think that largely comes from the fact that as the, I'm, I'm going to get on my soapbox for a second, but as, as the, uh, Come join me, mate. Come and join me on the soapbox. The sort of, uh, occupational risk management, as I would broadly term it, has, has existed as a profession since, let's say, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, yeah. OSHA kind of kicked off. We started to get up and running. We, and, and there was a whole lot of, of, um, kind of low hanging fruit to be gained by proceduralizing things and, and, Let's let's just start instituting workplace observations. Let's put in an incident investigation system. Like, like it was bare bones. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're seeing today, and, and this is a tremendous example of it, is that we we've never evolved the metrics beyond that by simply saying are and, and those metrics of counting near misses is simply a count of are we doing anything? Are we doing paperwork? It's just a count of the paperwork. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not an indicator for safety whatsoever. No, and, and I think that that that's where I think there's like this 
intellectual dishonesty on behalf behalf of or on the part of, uh, I would say a significant portion of, I would say just well, corporate entities writ large in that we all know you go to a work site and I, I come from an operational background, like half of the things we were doing for safety were do completely safety. pointless. I, I, I had a, a particular moment of, um, let's say, civil disobedience where I was responsible for safety on this kind of offshore oil and gas site. And one of, our, one of the uh, things that I was required to do was a weekly photo-based report where I would submit a certain amount of photos, at least three photos of safety issues, and then photos of the resolutions, which is like at a certain, it's, it's a, I, I think good in theory, but at a certain point it became like purely an ex, you just had to tick the box. Yeah. And so I started doing them, but just not submitting them. And I went several months before anybody said, where's <laughs> that report? And I was like, you're clearly not looking at it. Like, what is this meant to be doing? Yeah. And so in, in the context of these, yeah. Exactly. And, and I think that, that what, what you've just explained in this context where you've got a bunch of very obvious omissions, omissions from a like common sense risk management perspective, but this, so, let's say, myopic focus on, hey, let's, let's all call out that we have a few near misses in our daily meetings. It's a, it's a, like this is a quintessential case of failing to measure what matters. If they're simply measuring, oh, we're safe because we've reported six near misses in our daily meeting, we've ticked that box with never having a dialogue around what is that meant to, meant to achieve? Um, you know, are we, what, what might be a more interesting metric is uh, how, what's our ratio of near misses that lead to action versus, you know, or are closed? Because that would actually require somebody to do either close it, you know, disregard this near miss. It was, you know, reported an error or we're going to do something about it. That would force someone to, on some sort of regular basis, review the near misses and decide what we're going to do about them. But nobody ever measures these things or, or very rarely. And, and, and there's no discussion of how are we, how are we taking these great starter places for conversations and measuring the way that they change outcomes in our organization. That's mm. to me, what's so much more interesting to be discussing as, you know, Hey, we get 6,000 or six near misses reported and we have a hundred percent closure rate. And if you want to see the way we close all these, it's public within our organization to all the employees who submit them. If you showed me you were doing that, I'd say you guys are on top of things. But if mm. you're simply saying we've got 6,000 near misses and we haven't done anything with it to me, I, I would have a lot of um, questions. A lot of questions to just simply say, where, where's the rest of the data to, to prove that this is actually leading to, to changes right. and outcomes. Ultimately, like you can fiddle that system as well. Like, you know, to, okay. to your example, you had to take a photo of the problem and then a photo of the solution as well. And it still didn't mean anything. So like you were being measured on closing that issue out and it still didn't mean anything. And I've been at companies where we measure the closeout and it still didn't mean anything because the closeouts were just bollocks. Um, so, but, but ultimately it's just like, it, it's not like sitting there in this position of naivety. It's like, it comes back to that point. It's that testable, tangible confidence. Like, you know, it, oh, they're all closed out. Okay. But like, you're confident in that I can go on the shop floor and you can go on the shop floor and, and what you see in your boardroom, in your dashboards, on your systems, et cetera, is reality. Like the academics call it workers done, workers imagined. Like that's where we're trying to get to. And I think there's one, there's one simple, simple way to get a really good insight of workers done, workers imagined. Well, actually it's not simple. Um, because it depends on the psychological safety and the culture and stuff, but just fucking talking to people, just getting off your ass at the boardroom, at your nice corner office, whatever it is, and get on the shop floor, open your eyes and talk to people, you know, go up to people and say, what, what's, what is frustrating today? What's frustrating you today? Yeah. How's work today? They will tell you. Yeah, if you've built up an, a, you know, a, a culture in which they feel comfortable to tell you, if they don't feel comfortable to tell you, then you need to look at yourself and how you're dealing with people. But, but that aside, like, let's assume that they are comfortable to tell you. They will tell you. 
100%. And their response will be such a good insight, such a good insight into how they see safety, how they manage safety and, and so on and so forth. But you didn't, you could go to this company that I was referring to and you could read their papers and read their systems. I think they're a really safe company because near misses were being dealt with. They're being reported. They're being dealt with. It's in the conversation. Safety is at the top of the agenda. Really plush looking sexy ass policy, loads of risk assessments, loads of SOPs. And then go on a shop floor and see the real world. You've got unguarded machines left, right, and center. Wouldn't pass CE marking. There's massive drainage issues on site, like huge traffic issues. Like it just, I mean, I could go on all day. P- staff didn't even have PPE, like e-stops not working. So it it's getting on the shop floor and looking and seeing, you know, like Sherlock Holmes says, is like you look, but you don't see or something like that. That That is literally the best way to, to get these signals is to just go and look. Sorry, Joe, you're I'm muted. Muted. I was muted. Um, when, when you say that, is... Is this ultimately a fidelity issue? Is it a, you know, when you talk about going to the shop floor, is that, is that because that's a great way to get a, a wide funnel of, of information? Because I think that is, like, I would absolutely agree with you. You know, when I used to be, um, you know, chief officer on deep water construction vessels, like one of the primary things you do, because again, you're, you know, you sit on the bridge, you're drinking your coffee, looking at the window, you might feel like everything's going well, but you got to go put your coveralls on and go walk around. And, and that's what's going to give you the best kind of feel yeah. for what's happening. Um, I, I feel like the, the, pro, the challenge with that, because it is such a powerful tool, is that it relies on the competence or, or what have you of the person doing that walk oh, around. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And, and so that it becomes challenging to endorse as like a, a, a fix all because it, it won't work if your people are crap. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's that I think we need to be very clear. We, the, there is no fix all. There is no silver bullet whatsoever. Like near misses are not shit. They're just mostly used shit. Like, yeah. so near misses could potentially work really well. Um, incident reporting could potentially work really well. Like all of that stuff, it works. It's just, you have to go have that conversation to say, is this delivering value? So like, I, again, I was, I was at a different company um, with a meeting the other day, the, the, the company with the lift plans. And, and they had all of this beautiful stuff and the systems. And I said, how much do you talk to your staff? And they were like, all oh, the time we do this meet and that meet and this meet and that meet and this meet. And I knew we were really drilling down. I knew what was going on, but we were trying to like really drill in and get them to say it. And finally, we got to the point where they went, do you know what, James? I don't think we're having conversations with our staff. I think we're just telling them stuff. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yes, right. Let's talk about that. Why do you think that? And I was like, well, I'm just thinking now, like, this meeting and that meeting and this meeting and this meeting. This meeting is safety going. These are the stats. This is where we are. This uh, this meeting here is the supervisor saying this is the plan for the day. I don't think once any any one of us in the SMT are going to the shop floor and saying, what do you think about this? Unless it's in a really formal process like a survey. And I was like, exactly. You're disseminating information, which you need to do. It's not one or the other. You're disseminating information, but that feedback loop doesn't exist. You're not having conversations. So it's not, it's not get rid of near misses. It's just do them better. Well, I, I, I don't like near misses personally. I like signals and, and just a different language. But ultimately, if I went to a customer and they were like I'm doing near misses and it worked, it delivered value and I could see it and it was tangible, then keep it, man. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, if it works, yeah. it works. I ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, I, I think that, I, I think we're saying the same thing, but I think maybe, and again, I'm we're just soapboxing at this point. I think mm-hmm. what, what's been so for me, so coming from that background, that kind of operation, let's sit down, let's like, let go have a coffee with the guys and see what's going on here. Uh, I think for me now working in, let's say like the venture back tech space, that's like a, a very different world in a way that, that I find very intellectually inspiring because it's such a different way of handling problems. And I mm-hmm. feel like the, the example that I when, I, when I talk about fidelity, I mean, we, what I'm talking about is that, that piece that you've said, which is like saying, if it works, 
And, and I guess what I'm saying, or where, where I see this huge opportunity, and I don't know what the solution is, don't get me wrong, but it's around saying, um, if, if I was looking at marketing for our company, for example, and I solely looked at how many people come to our website as the measurement of our marketing success, it's obvious in the ways that that, that could give me like a, uh, an insufficient picture of what's happening. So instead, what we do is we, we understand, you know, who are the people who we've re reached out to via email? Have they visited our website? Have they then, have they watched a video of a product demo? And then have they filled out a product form? Well, that's actually going to give me a little bit more fidelity on the intent of this user. And it helps mm -hmm. me say, oh, this is worth me having a meeting with this person. Or if I have somebody who visits my website and then says, hey, I'm here to offer you outsourced IT services, I'm going to say like, well, this is like a low quality uh, meeting request and, and I'm not going to do that. And I, I think that's where I see, you know, do, am I saying we don't need to go and have coffees with people and ask them how it's going? Absolutely not. But I think there's so much opportunity to have a conversation around saying, could we agree on, near misses as an example, but you could do this with anything, what are the you know, not what's that one metric of quantity of submissions, but how do we make a dozen metrics that we could find a way to programmatically kind of pull in so that we know the, like if it's working in a way that we can measure and then a way that we can help get better in the future. And I think that yeah. that's like that, that sophistication there, every other industry in the world is doing this. Yeah. And, and safety is still talking about like, well, it's not about near misses. It's about behavior-based observations. And it's like, <laughs> we're ha we're talking about the icing and we're not talking about the cake. There, yeah. All of these things are starters for conversation, but unless we establish sort of an agreed upon metric of measurement, mm. it's, it's all just hot air. It's like, what's the flavor of the week? We'll institute that. And then we'll wonder why, oh, we had no incidents last year. Two people lost limbs this year. Uh, must have just been COVID. Uh, that that's kind of the uh... <laughs> yeah, that's so true. One of the things that you're you're touching on here is so important. Is what we don't do in safety is actually stress test. Like we don't yeah. test things when we when we say we're going to do an audit. All, all we're doing is counting paperwork. Like yeah. now you might say, or oh, you know, there'll be people listening to this and go, "Oh, that's just a bad auditor. That's just a bad auditor." But like, it's not like. That is what an audit is. An audit is a systems process, but like actually testing if things work. So like you could do two drills a year for your fire of a, a emergency, for your emergency evacuation, right? You could do 10 drills a year, right? But unless in that process you're learning and adjusting and, and improving, then it's not going to matter. So if you're just drilling, you're like, oh, uh, it's another drill. Here we go. Um, oh, I, I, we're not achieving anything. So yeah. I, it's, I mean, it's fascinating when we come back to the thing you said ages ago, which has just reminded me, where you said about the kind of cognitive dissonance. And this is the, the kind of the same thing as background again, is I actually made a video around uh, incident, um, emergency evacuation, right? I, I read a academic paper a long ago, a long time ago, it was given to me by a gentleman in Tiny Ware Fire Service, which is a very big fire service in the UK, right? And for the life of me, I can't find this paper ever again, which one day I will bloody find it, right? But this paper basically said, very long and short, is that there's no evidence that a surprise fire drill or emergency drill has any benefits but there is lots of evidence that say it doesn't have it has negative impacts so therefore we advise that you should do planned emer uh, emergency drill so everyone knows about it right so when you start breaking it down and you read into it you're like shit that makes a lot of sense so like when you do loads of surprise drill what is the, what is the biggest problem when the fire alarm goes off in your office joe what's the biggest problem guarantee it's everyone going is it a drill? Yeah. Is, it, is it is it a drill? What day is it? What day is it? Is it Monday? We test the alarm on Monday, isn't it? What's yeah, but he, he did that, didn't he? You know, what's it? Sheila, 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 is it a drill? Like and like 10 minutes fucking later, you know, I've had people walk from one end of a hospital to the other end of the hospital to find the safety person to say, is it a drill? And I'm like, it's like a two-mile hospital. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So not having it surprised solves that problem to a point right in that if they are surprised they're like we haven't been told it's a drill therefore it's a fire 
Now, the military do this all the time. This is not a drill. This is not a drill, right? So that, oh my God, this is serious. We're actually under fire. We don't do that in safety. We're like, is it a drill? Is it not? Oh, because I'm safety and I'm oh, that, that's a control I have, right? So I made a video and I said, this is backed up by not only academia, a very large city-based metropolitan fire service, the London Fire Service, which is commonly kind of like the guru of, of safety, fire safety in the UK, and then the actual guru of fire safety, the National Fire Chiefs Council, had backed this up as well. So potentially the four biggest bodies in fire safety in the UK had backed this approach. So I made a video, told everyone about it, right? And I had somebody message me who runs a hospital and I've got loads of experience in the NHS. He runs a hospital and he was like, oh, no, nah, I don't agree with that. How can, you, how can you fucking not agree with it? Like the fire service back it. Like, do you need any more? Like, that's like going to Lewis Hamilton and Lewis Hamilton's like, this is how you drive a Formula One car. And you're going, nah, don't back that, mate. Like, you just i don't care whether you back it it's the actual way to do it it's stress tested it's proved in academia it's actually how we need to move forward so we don't actually test to bring back to my original point and close this out we don't test if this things actually these things are actually delivering value we just audit them how many drills have you done this year two well done you're yep. compliant you're not compliant because if they don't get people out the fucking building they're not, they're not compliant at all because people will die and you will go to court. Yeah. So you, if you're not stress testing it, you're just counting paperwork. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't, like, I, I think this just comes down to um, like what I would broadly term the, the engineering mindset, like break down a problem, execute a test, mm -hmm. iterate, keep those yeah. tests short and keep like that to, to me, that is the fundamental notion of being a performative person in literally any role. Yeah. is can you break down the problems that you're facing and run tests against them so that you can uh, sort of demonstrably and incrementally make progress against that solution. And I think that's what, again, as I've dug deeper and deeper into this problem, it's what you see, like, it, it can sometimes be frustrating because you have all these, like, again, it, it, it's this extremely surface level conversation where you mm -hmm. say, oh, how, how do you back this up? What, why do you think instituting a behavior-based safety program at your company is going to drive value? It's like, oh, I read a cool blog post. I'm like, okay. So they, like, it, do you feel as though people don't feel empowered to, to call people out when they see unsafe behaviors? Do you think that people aren't, um, you know, mindful enough to be taking those moments to, you know, to, to take a break and, and point something out? And yeah. if that's not the case, what evidence do you have to support that that particular set of tooling is the solution for the problems that you're facing? And again, to me, and maybe this is just me as a, a bit of a dork, but, but to me, this just goes down to the fidelity of, you know, with, without that baseline, like w without increasing what we measure fundamentally and, and getting away from, I think, as you said, like, I know there's a lot of strong feelings around measurement in safety, but it's because what we're, we're like, what we're measuring is, is so well, it's because we don't really know what to measure. Like we, we, yeah. we as a profession don't really know what, indicates good safety and most and, and, and safety so, won't admit that they'll go oh yeah we don't have any accidents and then, then we're obviously safe because no but yeah but the, there is academia that backs that that not that is not tied to the presence of safety well i don't believe in that academia oh I'm fucking hell like, what do you want me to do then yeah like, a thousand percent and and so if we're not going in and saying hey what in in that case oh we don't have incidents so what are the how do we understand the broader like um, pre-incident environment of safety in a way that helps us understand, oh, we truly are being safe. And it's not just that we've created so much pressure by taking aerial photos of people organized into a big number of how many million LTI hours we have without an incident that we've created so much cultural pressure that people could cut their legs off. They're going to say they did it at home because nobody's going to be that person who breaks that thing. And yeah. And because we, we, we don't have that fidelity, or again, this is, this is my soapbox, but be, because we're not understanding what's that, what are those pieces, it's all just heretical, it's anecdotal. How do, how do we understand what's, what's working and what's not? And, and to me, that's the most exciting part is how do, if, if we were able to start that, and you could start it in a really narrow way, let's like some a workplace observation program or a, 
a work permit program, like what's something broad and like how, what, what's the smallest thing you could implement and test and then do that everywhere and, and learn from that. It, mm. I, I'm so excited for the way, the way those conversations could evolve in the future and, and get away from, I'm this type of safety person or I'm this type of safety person and get to a place where we say, hey, you know, in the same way, if I'm a marketer, there's like some standard metrics I could look at and know if I'm marketing successfully, those exist in safety, but mm -hmm. it's like, we're, yeah, we're looking the other way on that stuff. Let's just look at our TRIR and hope for the best. We, and we also have to like get to a, like not, not to defend the profession. Cause I agree with everything that, that you say, <laughs> but like the, in the UK, the biggest bodies that represent us as a profession don't, don't back that academic like statistics there's academia that says statistically trirs not they're invalid they don't make any statistical sense whatsoever it, and essentially why don't they make sense because not enough people die like so we don't have enough people dying to work out whether that statistically is valid or not therefore it's a waste of time Right. We know that accidents, counting accidents is not an indicator for the presence of safety. It, it is an indicator that you've got a problem that you need to look at 100 percent. But a absence of negativity isn't a presence of positivity. So I really like Eric's. Uh, what Eric says is that you wouldn't you wouldn't try and work out how to get a good marriage marriage by only looking at divorce, which is just one of my favorite lines ever. And when you say that to people, they're like, shit that makes so much sense like and all we're saying is keep looking at divorce because we need to learn about how not to do it but also look at the good marriages as well and that's all we're saying in safety that's all i'm saying is that carry on doing that shit if you want to do it right but let's look at what's actually happened let's look at the presence of good where is the presence of good so what does the presence of goods look like it's the shop floor having conversations like that lift plan example i want to go to a person who's who's lifting tons and tons and tons of bits of kit and i want them to turn around and say safety on this place yeah that's well i, I don't know if you call it safety it's just kind of my job like when i'm lifting i'm looking at the chains i know that the chain's been inspected because it's got this color code in i look i know how to look at it myself you know i know to i always think about my route and i always do that. like i want to have that conversation with them not the safety team that to me is a presence of positive that to me is a good indication of good safety is does it mean you'll never have a big incident in your in in the company ever no but what it does mean is you're much less likely to have it you're building resilience yeah. you know but it's not one or the other it's both and that's why i struggle when people go so what do you do james do you do the cultural stuff or the technical stuff and i'm like well it depends where you are in your journey because this company I'm working with at the moment that's really shit at both, it's both. I'm doing both simultaneously because we've got technical stuff. I'm One day I'm, I'm looking at the machine and I'm like, right, I'm with the engineer and I'm like, I need a guard there, I need a guard there, and I need a guard there. This is why. Like, what do you think? Do you agree with? I'm having an engaging conversation with him. And so it's an educational opportunity because I want him to spot that next time, mm. right? Then the next day, I'm with the same company and I'm having a much more cultural, leadership, behavioral type conversation with the CEO to find out how the fuck we got into this position, <laughs> right? And how he behaves with his, with his team and, and how did he not know that this stuff was happening? That's the cultural, resilience, safety to whatever you want to call it stuff. It's one and two at the same time, not one or the other. Yeah, I, I think that it, it to me, or what what you've just explained here is what like in statistics like the bayesian statistics as in you're looking at triggers yeah, to circle yeah. back and make corrections that he, this is i think that that sophistication piece that like here you want to you need to learn as much from the tasks that are completed safely as a way to reinforce the rec, the, the guidance you provide that works as you need to go back and correct the guidance you provide when when you have an incident like to me that that's the fundamental value of of an incident reporting system is as to act as a trigger to create a correction against your system and and again if that's i i like your uh, divorce quote here if that's right. the only thing you're using to learn from if you're hey let's pull uh all the documents that these people created before they went to work and then let's institute a new one uh then 
then again, I think we're we're going to lose the plot it's, a little bit. And it's uh, so funny yeah, as well. It's cultural. It? It's technical. It's everything, as you yeah. said. And, and it's funny that in safety, it's like the only thing that we that we just look at the negatives. Like Joe, you're an entrepreneur, right? Here's a load of books on failed entrepreneurs. Like you just wouldn't read loads of books of companies that have just gone shit. Would you like I'd read one or two? I mean, there'd be a lot to learn in there, but yeah, you, uh, you would 100% read the odd one or two and you would educate yourself on how not to do it. But a lot yeah. of your time will be reading about jobs and gates and, you know, you know, I don't know, Simon Sinek or whatever, you know, be reading all of this stuff on how to be better. Well, in safety, we just have within, I think the conversations are getting better. I think, a lot of these really annoying bickering conversations that we are having that are a bit icing on the cake. They're a little bit high level. I think that's a, it's a necessary step in the journey because we're having better conversations. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and this is literally why we made PM project Malik, that I mentioned is the other company I run with my business partner so that we could have these, com- we talk, we have conversations like this on a Wednesday and a Friday every week with directors of, some of the biggest brands in the UK um, and and Ireland as well, and some professionals that are working for companies that you've never heard of and you never will hear of because they're, they're small or they're sneaky or whatever. And then some people that are not even safety professionals, they're scaffolders that want to be a safety professional, right? But we're in this lovely, diverse little group and we, we have conversations. So we'll be like, let's talk about near misses, people, right? I want to talk about near misses and we'll have this conversation. And do we have the high level conversation about what even is it? Yeah, we do 100%. But I think it's an indicator that we're having better conversations because when I started the podcast, I know I want to talk about this because we are sitting pretty. We think we're fine in the UK. We've accepted that we kill about 140 people a year and we're just okay with that. Like that's cool. Off we go. Like, and, and I was working for this company the other day the, the, doing that, that lift plan stuff. And the, the, one of the reasons we were in there is because somebody lost the top of their finger and they were like, we're a really safe company. Um, and I was like, okay, define safe. Like, how, why do you think you're a safe company? Well, ultimately we, we don't really have, you know, a lot of accidents, right? So ultimately I want to see what you guys can do, can reduce accidents. Okay. Let's, let's play with that for a second. Prior to us coming in off the back of the series of, of a few accidents, you went like six years without an LTI, right? And they were like, yeah, yeah, it was really good. I was like, okay, cool. And you use that to justify that you were safe. Yeah. But then all of a sudden the guy lost his finger. Yeah. So I don't think the guy that lost his finger or top of his finger would agree that you're a safe company. Do you think he would agree? Let's bring him in the room and ask him and say, Hey, four and a half finger man do you think that this is a safe company i don't think he'll agree i really don't think he'll agree so are you willing to have that conversation in that we need to go deeper with this and i think to start that conversation we have to have those high level annoying bickery conversations which i equally joe get so frustrated by and i'm like can we just fucking move past this now and move on to like some valuable conversation but i think it's part of the journey i don't, I don't know i might be wrong i oh, might no, be wrong. I, I i think you're totally right because i think well I, it's how we're sussing out this dissatisfaction and i think yeah. you know you you hit on this earlier where you said, I, I think to a certain extent, it's become a limiting factor around the regulators and saying, well, they only care about TRIR. So we're, we're kind of hamstrung. And I think what, what I'm so excited about here is that it's through, you know, this increase in dialogue through podcasts like yours. And, and to a certain extent, what we're trying to do here is that we're trying to kind of arm the rebels and say all these safety professionals who think they're doing things differently, who say, we're trying to get rid of all the fluff and focus on what matters. And and I talk to so many who say we do things different here. And I, I kind of chuckle to myself because I say that every single person says that. But there's this kind of fundamental belief that that everybody else is kind of doing things the old way. And and I think if we can if we can elevate that conversation and get people more focused on, on what are those things we could do to, yeah. to quantifiably improve, the regulators will follow us. We can't wait for them to lead us there. And, yeah. and we need to we need to elevate this conversation to say compliance is not 
the, the end goal, compliance is at the starting place. We need to focus on excellence and let's define what that is so we can get there as quick as possible. There's, there's something you said there, Joe, which I want to echo that. The regulator follows the people. And we all think that we follow the regulator. Like, no, 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 no. The community, we, we think we have no power. Like, and, and we think that we just wait until they do as we're told, right? We have never had it sounds like i'm becoming a bit of a socialist now right but like we have never had more power than we have right now like i, I don't know i'm not an econ an, an, an economist or a socialist or anything like that but i feel like russia is losing the war because of social media right not because of anything else because the world has come together Right. And then let's use a little bit of a less controversial uh, example that I know nothing about. <laughs> I, I might be wrong there. And someone's like, what the fuck is he talking about? And they would be very fair to say, what is he talking about? A, a better example would be, and I've used this several times, is Barack Obama in America. When he was a president, he was when he was a president, when he was first president, he was asked about gay marriage. Do you support it? Right. And he, he, he outright said no in one of his interviews. He said, no, I don't support it, right? But yet he was a president that legalized gay marriage. Said, what? So when did he change? We all just assumed that he was always this, like, really kind of this, this social kind of left, whatever person, whatever you want to label that as, right? And he'd done this amazing thing by legalizing gay marriage. So, so, finally, so he should, like, finally, Jesus Christ. But we get to that point. And we go, hang on a minute. You're telling me he wasn't always like this? So when did he change? He changed when the fucking polls changed. When the polls changed and the polls said, you need to legalize gay marriage because that's how you're going to get more votes and win and stay next time, that's when he changed. That's such a good story to say, if you're not happy with how the regulator is operating, then you need to start showing the regulator better ways yeah. to do it. As long as... You know, in the UK, we have really nice legislation that just says, just manage the risk as far as reasonable and practicable. Essentially, here's some guidance to say this is how we think it's the best way to do it. But otherwise, you do it another way. As long as you can prove to us that you think you're doing that and we agree with you, we don't really give a shit. So, like, we've got these, we've got, I've been talking about this for so long. We got two pieces of academic research completed. Um, were they both in the UK? Yeah, both in the UK. One by Aberdeen University that's just come out recently. It's gone a bit viral recently. That says, um, lift with a straight back and bent knees is not good advice. And then another piece that says, manual handling training it, is not effective, right? It doesn't, doesn't improve uh, uh, lifting technique or anything like that. So that one says you're better off doing strength and conditioning training with your staff. And the other one says we're better off have being more educated about how our spine is each person and stuff like this. So we've got two now, two pieces of academia. One of those pieces of academia were, were written by the regulators science department. And yet we're still delivering manual handed training. And the, the regulator will still ask you for manual handling training. Okay, so deliver manual handling training, but change it. Let's, let's, let's call it manual handling training because that's what they want. But let's talk about strength and conditioning. Let's talk about learning about your spine. Let's talk about how you can work out how you can lift better. Because we do that, the regulator goes, oh, that's really nice. I like that. They'll tell someone else about it. Uh, start a fucking podcast about it. Right? Do a YouTube video about it. Get viral on LinkedIn and loads of people will start doing it. And boom, we change the guidance we change the regulator whatever well and, and i think that there's, there's even maybe a there, there's maybe a step between that which is that if you're if you're also focusing on and, and again this is uh i don't mean to always harp on on measurement but i actually think that that's how we, we lead to meaningful change is that if you can demonstrably act or show that that hey we did we made this change and outcomes changed accordingly You've all of a sudden, in a you know scientific, rational way, with clear supporting data, created a moral obligation for for the broader industry to say we have to like the way the regulation is is even written. If that's the best way to do it, that's where you're you're going to be expected to do. So what's yeah. going to happen is your compet your keen competitors will follow you. Uh, 
the rest of them will follow you as soon as your clients start to demand it because you've set that standard. And as once enough of them do it, the regulators will follow. But but I think again, there's uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. There people have so much more power to, to go back to your original uh, uh, socialist point here uh, that that people have so much more power uh, than they realize. And if, I I think that's so inspiring, right? If we were able to come in and and, and really say. How do we define what the best thing is? How do we document it? And how do we share it? And I think, you know, in, in many ways, that's what, uh, you know, th th that's what these conversations are, are are trying to achieve. So yeah, yeah. And and the more of them we have, the more people like people find it really strange that I do a podcast in safety, which is quite niche, and I encourage more people to do more podcasts in safety. Like, oh, James, you're not adding your competition. No, we need more talk. More people having conversations. I don't give a shit if you've got all the exact same guests as me because it'll still be a slightly different conversation. And there's people who hate listening to me and they don't or maybe they're like oh i listen to him because there's just no one else in the uk or whatever right and but but they do it for gritted teeth because they just hate my accent or the fact that i swear or whatever i don't know right but somebody else bob down the road for me starts right? and he doesn't swear and he, he's very calm and not energetic and ranty like i am then you might like that person and do you know what? That's okay. Like, please go listen to that person because he's having the same good conversations that I'm having, but in a different manner that works for you. More people need to be having these conversations, whether we find them, uh, whether we find them uncomfortable or not, whether we find them a little bit bickery at first or not, like it doesn't matter. Let's just have more conversations about how can we get better at doing this. Okay. Well, I, I think that's, um, you know, that, that's a great place for us to start wrapping this up. I feel like this is maybe part one. I feel like we could probably do this for a little while. Um, we do like but, part but, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, yeah, I could go about this all day. We need to do a mini series. Uh, bef before we wrap things up here, uh, one of the things I, I like to ask wherever possible is, uh, and, and this is particularly relevant for, for yourself, uh, who, who else should we have on the show? Anyone, you know, maybe a practitioner in, in a company that you work with or something like that, that that you think could come in and, and share some real sort of actionable strategies and tactics for, for our audience? I can give you a very long list, if I'm honest, a very long list. To a few people come to mind, uh, a lady called Crystal Danbury. She is the director of safety and something else at Sainsbury's in the UK. Very, very amazing woman amazing woman um oh god you know what i could live i could list all of my members at project Malay and they're all amazing um i'm just trying to think of ones that would come on um elisa lynch she will hate the fact that i've told you to, to talk to her but she uh safety manager i think or safety head head of safety for a construction company in ireland she's done a couple of podcasts she's awesome i love her she swears more than me so just fyi she's irish so they all like that yeah um she's amazing my business partner colin Nottage from he uh, he does another podcast called interest in health and safety podcast um he's a consultant same as i am so um and he's he's kind of I don't want to say old, that's not fair, but like he's older. So like he's, he's like, he's been in the game for, for a long time. Um, so, you know, I remember when I first met him and I, I've told him this, like when I first met him, I was like, it's just another old safety guy that doesn't know what he's talking about. And then I was like, Oh, actually this guy's pretty cool. And now I now I run a business with him. Um, so like, he's amazing. Um, we might, David, we might have to cut that out for, for his benefit here. I'll, we'll, we'll share that with the editor. So can, loads uh, worse than old. You can leave that in. Okay. Um, right. He feels me worse as well. And then probably David Provan is, is a very impressive man uh, in safety. who's both, both an academic and a practitioner, which I really like. So he runs a podcast with Drew Ray called the safety of work podcast. So he's a very, very prominent and good safety thought leader. So you ask for one, you got like five. There you go. Yeah. All right. Well, Val, um, on, the, on the production side, she's got her homework to do. Uh, awesome. So I guess James, obviously thanks. Thanks so much for, for coming through. How, uh, how can people, you know, find more of your stuff if, if they want to check out all your uh, awesome projects? Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, if you, the easiest way is you can Google rebranding safety as in we're rebranding the company, rebranding safety and the YouTube and the podcast will come up. If you want to listen to podcasts, it's available on pretty much all the platforms, which I was just reading a blog 
just as we joined this, which I think all of them are owned by Spotify now, other than Apple, like they're just buying them all. Um, so yeah, Spotify, Chatable, all of those, we, we are on all of those. So just Google rebranding safety. You can go to rebrandingsafety.com. There's not much on there, but that's, um, you can go to there if you want. If you want consultancy, we do work primarily in the UK. We are 100% open to talking internationally as well. Um, but that is risk fluent. So risk fluent as in fluent as in the language, riskfluent.com. Um, or you can just find me on LinkedIn. I'm most prominent on LinkedIn. So James McPherson on LinkedIn. I'm on there all day, if I'm honest, all bloody day. Um, if you're a safety professional, then Project Miletium, which is really hard to spell. And we didn't think that through when we thought of the name. Um, but I shall send Joe the link, but it's Project Miletium, which is M-O-L-L-I-T-I-A-M.com. So that's if you're a safety professional and you're looking for like a mastermind professional development community, 100%, you will love that. We have conversations like this all the time, all the time. Okay. So that's everything, mate. Thank you very Fantastic. much. Fantastic. Well, we'll make sure that, that all those links uh, end up in the show notes if anybody wants to check those out. And uh, I, again, I guess, yeah, thanks so much for, for coming on. Looking forward to parts, you know, two through 15, uh, whenever, whenever we can make those happen. Sure thing. Thank all you right. for having me. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Safety Leaders Now with Joe Meadows. This show is presented to you by OpsLog and produced by me, Valeria Karnau. Big thanks to Diala for the theme music and Hatch for editing the podcast. Our next episode comes out in a week. If you haven't already, please rate, review, and subscribe to Safety Leaders Now on any platform that you stream podcasts. If you want to connect with Joe, don't hesitate to reach out to him on LinkedIn at Joe Meadows. Thanks for listening. Catch you on the next episode.